Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peacock. We have a brand new website, combatlearning.com. It's a lot better than the previous website, much more user-friendly, and there's more content on there. Uh, it, you can look at all the episodes, the backlog, um, the about page, and you can even send me messages to ask me questions. So while you're on the website, go ahead and navigate to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to get subscribed to updates on the podcast and training resources. To say thanks, I'll give you my transfer cheat sheet, a simple list of do's and don'ts for how to design your practice activities for maximum effectiveness. If you've ever wondered if your training methods are going to transfer to competition or self-defense, this cheat sheet is for you. Plus, I'll give you my little ebook, an introduction to motor learning for martial artists to get you up to speed on what we're talking about. Go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to claim that now. Today, I'm joined by Bryant Costin and Seneca Savoy, historical European martial artists who specialize in coaching the sword at their club, Arena Weapon Arts. In this episode, Bryant and Seneca recount their journey from a traditional technique and drill-based sword coaching style to a games-based practice and finally arriving at a full-bore constraints-led approach. They go into detail about how they approach practice design, curriculum development, as well as coaching and correction. We also talk at length about representativeness and how previous experience and other skills can form what's called attractor states that influence the way you move when acquiring developing a newer skill. Of note also is their account of how training with more aliveness actually lowered their injury rates instead of making it worse. So if you're excited to jump in, hit the subscribe button on your podcatcher and enjoy the show. All right, you guys, welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. Um, I would like you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience and um, give your background in martial arts. Uh, I guess we can start with Brian. Hey, yeah, I'm Brian Costin. I run Arena Weapon Arts. Um, I have been doing weapons-based combat sports for uh, a little under the last 10 years. All in all, I think my martial arts experience is, is probably around the 20-year mark. I have a number of traditional martial arts behind me. Those are um, mostly Chinese-based. Um, I've spent time in various forms of Kung Fu. I've also spent time with, you know, like the distilled version thereof of Wing Chun. Um, I did a little bit of boxing and kickboxing. I've played with a little bit of wrestling. Um, I rolled with some couch guys for a little while. And uh, I've made studies of kind of various uh, forms of all of these different kinds of arts that exist throughout um, a lot of the wrestling. I've spent time looking into kind of older variants. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, go and look at a lot of the old Indian martial arts, Kushti and so on. Those types of like long lineages and what has changed and what hasn't based on, you know, maybe regional variants to rules and what kind of techniques are allowed and stuff like that. So um, I, I wouldn't call myself a, a martial arts scholar because I'm a terrible, terrible student, but um, I certainly have spent a, a, a large amount of my time digging into um, martial arts from around the world and, and trying to fit them into the, the mix of things that we do and finding what works and, and what really doesn't. Awesome. Yeah. Moving on to Seneca. <laughs> yeah. So um, my uh, initial exposure to martial arts was um, as a middle school and high school student. Um, so I had the luck that um, my babysitter, uh, when I was relatively young, um, was the wife of uh, a Ukrainian ex uh, expat um, who was on the pentathlon team and had um, a bronze medal. Um, so pent pentathlon is like all of the the fancy uh, gentlemanly sports, right? So like horseback riding, shooting, mm -hmm. and um, fencing. Um, so you do all five. And, and so his, of course, was, was FA fencing. So uh, my early exposure was with... Uh, yeah, kind of an Olympic level, uh, Olympic fencing coach. Um, and you know, that was as part of the, the round rock fencing club, um, uh, which produced some Olympic alternates and so on. Um, and me just being a, a 
a terrible, terrible athlete uh, in terms of like actual practices. So unfortunately uh, for me, I was pretty genetically gifted uh, at fencing. Um, and so I didn't do any GPP uh, my entire uh, middle school or, or high school, uh, which may be like a terrible fit to actually doing sports as an adult. Um, then I um, started doing uh, like martial arts uh, a little bit more in earnest um, around my early 20s. Um, that was primarily uh, in response to a brief period of time experiencing homelessness, which is like more violence uh, plugged into a year and a half than I'd experienced in my entire life up, up to that point uh, because you know, people fuck with you when you're homeless. Uh, and so I, I just kind of started shopping around. I did crawl for a little while. Um, it's terrible. We can discuss all the reasons. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, I uh, did Pikiti Tertia uh, for a, a fairly long period of time. And I would still probably identify that it's going to be one of, one of my base arts, um, in terms of like how I move and how I, uh, analyze other people's movements. Um, I've done various forms of basically the place where I was taking, um, Kali was on top of other places. Um, so, um, where I was studying with Leslie, there was also like an Inosanto place right below it. And you mm. can just go, classes for like 25 more bucks and you could go take um capoeira classes with Damon, who's another guy we'll probably discuss at some point um and so i had some exposure to to other combat sports i've i've done some boxing um i've uh, i've wrestled uh, as an adult as, as part of jiu-jitsu um i started doing jiu-jitsu um around 26 and it became really hard for me to keep my my schedule uh, up for it um because I worked in a call center for a majority of that time. So I would go like six, nine months off. So I'm a, I'm a, one of those people who's been a blue, blue belt for like seven years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> considering consistency of training. Um, and those are my base arts. I've also, uh, I, I, I was part of uh, monolith, which was Austin Sambo club um, when it was still established. Um, and that, that was a pretty good club. You know, it set some people to, to worlds a few times. Um, and I, I've trained pretty extensively with, with, uh, you know, Kurt Joe Kelly, who's probably the, the best Sambo player in North America, um, in terms of competition results. Um, did a bunch of judo, um, as part of Kokoro, um, which is a local judo club. Uh, and then I started doing, I, well, I initially started doing HEMA as, um, part of ARMA. Back in the day, which was like a oh, yeah. 1.0 of HEMA. Um, and that was uh, mostly an adjunct to my Kali study. And then I, I started doing, um, you know, these kind of mixed weapon arts uh, as part of Arena in 2020. Uh, because during the pandemic, it was like the only martial art you could do and, and make sure that people were staying six feet away from you uh, <laughs> while training live. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's those are quite quite the background. I uh, a funny thought when I, I watched your videos a few months ago, and there was some footwork you were doing. I was like, that looks like Kali footwork, where you were almost like a zigs, like a the triangle. Uh, what do they call it? The um, yeah, the male well, and the, the female footwork. triangles footwork. Yeah, the kind of diamond steps. Yeah, yeah, the diamond steps. And I was like, you know what? That actually, I feel like that would actually be more useful for a longer instrument like a sword than it would be for sticks because you have to get you don't have a lot of room to move with with the with the sticks because they're shorter yeah so i i the footwork is one of the things that that um is definitely fairly strong in in my movement um and you know obviously that was produced um I mean, we wouldn't get into whatever the questions are appropriate, but there's a mix of representative and un unrepresentative, um, mm -hmm. that, in particularly in Bikini Tertia Um yeah. So there's a pretty strong attractor for me to, to move that way. I also move that way when I'm boxing too. Oh, that's really interesting. So yeah, well, let's start to get into, um, we'll start at a higher level. So um, I, I don't know which one of you wants to to handle this one, or actually we you could just both answer this in your own way, but... Um, how is HEMA usually taught? And actually, I don't know if we've really covered what HEMA is. So if you want to cover what HEMA is real quick. Brian, you should take this since you've actually trained HEMA. I only did ARMA for a little bit and then I did this. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so HEMA is, is an acronym. It stands for Historical European Martial Arts. So um, if we if we get down to the nitty gritty and the real black and white definition of that, what HEMA actually is is a reconstructive study of old um, manuscripts that represent what are now dead martial arts lineages. Um, those studies resulted in a bunch of people functionally trying to recreate European swordsmanship in all of its uh, various facets. And, mm -hmm. and there are more elements to this than just swinging a big sword, of course. Um, any, any sort of uh, classical fencing technically falls under HEMA. Anything going back further than classical, which is kind of the pre-contemporary model, um, that could include uh, medieval longsword as likely as it includes, uh, you know, what we what we think of as almost like the German machetes. Um, these mm -hmm. are messers. So just messer just means knife, uh, but they're long knives. Um, this is also sword and buckler. Um, and honestly, fencing as a as a term historically was largely applied to weapons in general. So you you could fence. And, you know, you could be using a, a pole arm, you could be using a spear or quarter staff or some such. So um, fencing is, is a very large umbrella term that has been narrowed down in today's world to mean, you know, basically Olympic fencing um, yeah. with these, these reemergences of, of fighting arts, you know, uh, however, however you want to put it, functionally fighting arts with these other weapons, really that, that term is, is coming back as with its broader meaning. Um, as far as how these are are generally taught, the fact that these lineages were dead and are being reconstructed is a is a huge influencer on how they're taught. Right? Mm -hmm. When you have a dead lineage and you're attempting to reconstruct, especially in this case from like written word, all you have to go on are the descriptions of the things you're trying to recreate. These descriptions are functionally snapshots. They don't speak to the evolution of the thing over time. They don't speak to the mindsets of the individuals. If those individuals maybe are would, would have been more flexible in their in-person teaching, um, they're super super rote. Mm -hmm. um, and in and in many cases, right. And, and in many cases, those techniques are fit into plays or devices or sequences or like little mini kata where um, it's you do A, I do B, they do C. We're familiar with the prescriptive model, right? At this mm. point, so functionally, even in the old works, the the prescriptive model is used to give at at the very least examples of how this technique might have fit in, how this concept might have been applied in certain situations. Um, but at the most, it's this is specifically what you're trying to do, and you're trying to do no less in no other situation than what I have described here. And and rarely do any of the works actually say that. And so, um, some of the later works, some of the Renaissance works, Shil Marozzo, for example, um, he, he will functionally say, you're going to do this exactly the way I say it. And you're not going to go outside of our school and blah, 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 blah. But most of these, these old, let's say quote unquote masters, right? Um, most of these old fencing instructors functionally just kind of gave examples in their works. Um, when we go to reconstruct that and reconstruct the techniques, people are then taking those play blow by blow, blow plays and trying to recreate them in our current world with our current technologies. Um, that those could be the tools, the modern, modern design tools that we're using, our, our training tools, our swords, um, that are blunted and, uh, significantly more flexible and stronger and, you know, generally better constructed probably than they would have had. Um, we have much better safety equipment. And so um, those kinds of variables influence the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. But when we bring in um, when we when we bring in the fact that there's this big gap and people try to take verbatim like what's in the book and put it down, which you know, forgive any errors in translations that somebody might come across, mm -hmm. not only. Um, we're trying to go from old high German in some cases mm -hmm. to modern English, uh, yeah. it doesn't generally go well. Um, but many people are, are trying to fill in blanks that either weren't discussed in the books or they're just not getting maybe what, what the manuscript is trying to teach them via translation or interpretation or something. And they start to fill in um, gaps either with their own assumptions or with work from other martial arts. Footwork from Olympic fencing is highly prevalent in HEMA. 
Um, and there's actually no indication necessarily that footwork from Olympic fencing is what they would have used. Yeah. And yet it's, it's everywhere. Um, we actually find that, you know, and we've learned that certain things work better with certain weapons, as you kind of indicated earlier. With longer tools, that lateral motion kind of matters more. Um, so the Kali footwork actually does better for us in many cases than the Olympic footwork does. But there are times and places for a lunge, for a direct lunge straight down the center line of the opponent. Mm -hmm. um, so generally when he must taught, it's in a very prescriptive manner with this sort of frog DNA fit in, whether people realize they're doing it or not. Um, and if you break out of the mold or if you're somebody who maybe just wants to fight and, and isn't necessarily interested in the historical component, you know, there's, there's a little bit of kickback in many cases and that's less true now and it will be less true, even less true in the future. Um, but it is a very prescriptive approach. It is, uh, and it does take its chops from uh, traditional martial arts. Many people who are in HEMA have traditional martial arts background, traditional martial arts instruction. Um, and so the manuscripts themselves kind of lend towards trying to interpret and teach it from that lens. Excellent. Yeah, I would point out that, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian, but basically most of these books, right, and this kind of influences the way that, it, that it's taught, um, are just describing a very small number of techniques, right? Like when I was doing Arma and we were doing like Tallhofer, it was literally just five, right? It's just the five master strikes and they're like, this is what you do against the, the various incoming things and then here's some guards. Uh, to my knowledge, the only books that actually give details on how to train the things are like probably Hans Le Kuchner and then like, you know, later Renaissance stuff may have it that I haven't read, but in terms of the period that most people are thinking of for Hemo, which is mainly like Italian and German sources, most of those books have no instruction on how to do instruction at all. Maybe there's a little bit higher. Um, so like people are, are sometimes very obsessed about like trying to keep you know, the frog DNA out, but it's, there's, it's inevitable, right? Because you're, you're teaching the thing and there's no instruction on how to teach the thing. Yeah. And, and kind of lean on what Seneca pointed out about um, instruction across time periods, people who study earlier manuscripts generally have less to go off of. So those, those individuals are working off a, a, a smaller bank of techniques generally, or even when the, the work is fairly wide, widely encompassing of, of different, either weapons or, or um, different scenarios. The, the solution set example is, is generally pretty small. It's the same kinds of solutions to many of the, many of the problems. And he's just kind of like hammering in on this thing. Right. So um, it, it's, it largely, those kinds of things largely show tactical preferences on the, on the sides of the author rather than um, a truly limited set of, of technical solutions. Um, the, Later works um, in the Renaissance, generally early Renaissance to later, uh, mm -hmm. often include more fundamentals in addition to how you do the thing. They tend to be very verbose. Meyer is one of them. Um, it's kind of a, a very popular one, late German source. Then um, Fabris, any of the rapier manuscripts from later, from later Renaissance tend to be um, very articulate in, in how those fundamentals are executed. Uh, and in suggestions as to how overall concepts are applied and introducing mm -hmm. them as concepts and then giving examples of concepts. So the overall articulation and teaching of the thing dramatically improves over time. Um, I personally, I, I struggle to see why many people, uh, pick up the earlier manuscripts first because they're, they're largely inarticulate, mm -hmm. uh, by our modern standards. And so, um, it, it would be a much better study to kind of work backwards and, Sword, sword fighting was figured out a long, long time ago. Um, for somebody to say that, that you know, uh, weapons work or fighting in general, right? Um, that fighting in general was, is going to be dramatically different in the Renaissance versus the medieval period. It is like, I'm going to say they're kind of clueless. Um, and, and that's going to be a highly contentious statement among certain audiences. Um, they're, they're kind of clueless, right? Because Human human body mechanics ultimately have not changed that much in, in like a, a couple hundred years at most. So mm -hmm. um, the tools certainly influence movement and, and styles of yeah. movement and like tactical necessity. 
But at, at the end of the day, you know, a hinge is a hinge, a squat is a squat, a press is a press. The point is the point. Um, I'm going to put it in you and I'm going to try to not get hit. And, and that's the essence of all fighting, right? Like I'm going to try to get hit less. I'm going to try and hit you more until you're down and I'm not. Yeah. So broadly speaking, um, how has your training changed from, I think you mentioned in one of the, in one of our email correspondence that you used to teach kind of in a prescriptive model. So, or maybe you never did. Maybe you realized that you learned in a prescriptive model and you to realize that was wrong. So how has your training changed from what Huma traditionally has done to what you now do? Yeah. I, so, um, you know, I can kind of start on that and then it would be good for Seneca to pick it up where I leave off with his experiences that mm-hmm. how we just since he's been with us, because that, that certainly has also been dramatic in a way. Um, I, started my, again my, my background is in a lot of traditional martial arts um, I, I come from a culture of prescriptive approach to teaching a martial art largely because it was not um, intended for application it was intended for cultural preservation and uh, dissemination right mm-hmm. so when you look at it through that more snapshot and static lens it makes sense why prescriptive approach would be a thing that would become fairly standard in that environment but when you move into a fighting art, you have to, you have to change things because you actually have to apply these things against a totally like crazy number of unknown variables. All of that information kind of leads into the answer to your question. I came from this prescriptive approach. Um, the people that I was teaching HEMA with that I initially trained under and then taught with, um, all kind of came from a similar approach. There was a little bit of maybe some mixed martial arts ish in with that, but it, it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, competitive. It certainly wasn't necessarily applied in a stressed environment, I think. And based on what I understand at this point. And so all of my original HEMA background was with this prescriptive approach. And, and I knew that I struggled significantly trying to learn the stuff. Um, I'm just so stubborn that I stuck with it and, and ultimately kind of understood it to some degree. I started looking into the old works myself. I came up with my own interpretations. And, and, you know, once you kind of invest yourself into the solution, you usually it makes more sense to you, right? Because you, you mm-hmm. found your own solution to a problem. But that problem in my case was, I don't understand why we're doing the things exactly the way we're doing them in the context that we're doing them. And, and so I came up with my own interpretations that roughly fit the context and roughly fit the shape of what I was being asked to do. And it made more sense to me. The, um, and, and that, but that's a uh, student driven, right? Like, whereas really we should be aiming for teacher driven. Um, it's faster, more efficient. But, um, I taught, you know, and, and, and I taught all these techniques in a very prescriptive kind of way because that was just sort of the environment of the school. And, and we did work on improving that over time because we did want better fighters. We did still have competitions. So we went to competitions and, and, um, in many cases did not do very well overall. Mm. Um, it's kind of like when the, when the teacher does well, but the students don't, it's the, you have an engineer and management kind of problem. Um, you're not necessarily, yeah, you're, you're not necessarily looking for somebody who has the teaching or the coaching skills. You're looking for somebody who can do well, which is not always the best solution to the, to the teaching problem. Um, so, you know, and, and that original environment that I started in, everybody loved being there, you know, to, to, whatever degree, the people who stayed love being there, which is maybe its own problem in a way. But, um, and the people who didn't stay just said, this isn't for me. I was hoping for like actual sword fighting or I was hoping for more sparring or I was hoping for whatever, you know, or I was hoping for like not a bunch of nerds, which is, is <laughs> a lot of traditional martial arts kind of can sometimes bring in, especially yeah. sword fighting. As you might imagine, sword fighting attracts a lot of people who um, are maybe on the less athletic side who've been left out of a lot of school athletics and stuff like that. So, um, or, or they're less fit or they're, or, or they've been alienated, right? And, and mm-hmm. to some degree, so they're looking for something that piques their interest more than they're uncomfortable with the idea of doing the thing. Mm-hmm. They're, they're prioritizing. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of these people who, who, ne- who didn't necessarily know what to expect or had a background also in traditional martial arts and they just kind of accepted what we did. Many of them and myself all identified that people were stacking across the board. Um, they would get to a certain point. They would understand at least what I was trying to tell them, but no more. And, and a lot of that was because I, I wasn't giving them what they needed to 
learn better, faster, more thoroughly within their own context and in their own way that they can kind of invest themselves in. And so they never really built up above a certain point skill wise. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't build up a certain above a certain point skill wise, you don't really have the motivation to build up, you know, maybe physical attributes to support that increase in skill and so on. So I, that technical limitation actually to some degree even imposed like physical limitations uh, from a mindset issue. The, when I left uh, the last place that I taught HEMA at, um, I kind of started my own group and they, we, we, I was sort of like tongue in cheek HEMA still at the time. Um, I, I knew deep in my heart that what I was doing is not really HEMA anymore. Um, I was taking my own interpretation of the thing, basically tossing out the sources and saying, we're going to use just this initial interpretation as a base and it's going to evolve from here on its own. Um, and I took these techniques and I took these whatever and, and I said, hey, here's the technique we're working on. This technique is representative of what I believe is the concept that applies. And you're going to try and fit this into a, a slightly harsher environment. You're going to do drills with three examples um, of how you might use this concept. And then I'm going to say, um, all right, now your drill is going to be your opponent can throw any strike from any angle. And if you understand the concept, and they're, and they're going to throw it with intent, they're going to try and hit you in the head, right? Because we have these masks on. Um, if you If they have intent, and if you understand the concept, you should be able over the course of many reps to try and apply this concept under pressure. And therefore, you've started to drill it in a context that is more appropriate to sparring and then to competition. Um, but I was still operating on this very technique-based um, foundation. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with a bunch of students who ju it just didn't click for them. It just would not. And, and they were... Some of them were driving um, two hours in traffic from South Austin up to like Hutto, where our location was initially. I mean, and, and you know, I felt terrible. I, I, I didn't want them to show up to not improve or to even not to feel like they improved, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I started to reconstruct how the drills in the teaching methodologies were were being utilized and. Uh, what I came up with is all of these people, not just the ones who are doing well, but the ones who aren't doing well, all of these people um, learn differently. Every, every time I go to coach, I have to give different cues to everybody. Mm -hmm. and that tells me that I need, I don't need um, a thousand different teaching styles. I need to go a level up and I need to look at kind of a more all encompassing approach that will allow me to be economical in my efforts and allow me to produce results across a, a varied audience, right? Um, and these are people of all different physical typologies, um, all different athletic levels. And uh, so kind of by necessity, I just started making more games. And I, and I just said, hey, here are the games, here are the rules. Um, you, have to, you have to bind, which is when the swords connect, right? When the steel connects, you have to bind and then you can hit before you can hit them from the bottom, before you can hit them. So I'm creating a situation where people are having to learn how to bind and they're all going to bind differently, right? Like they're all, they're all going to come out with different iterations of mechanical leverage or they're going to fail. And if they continuously fail, they might ask for pointers at that time. And I'll kind of give them some examples of how they might do the thing. I did notice every time I give an example, people would overfocus on the examples, right? Because they're yep. really used to that prescriptive approach. Um, and so the sort of more thought provoking, almost arbitrary, um, arbitrarily feeling, um, approach it, it is difficult for people. Well, once they relearn it, um, they progress much faster. And, and it was a while to train everybody into that, but ultimately everybody kind of learned it. They expected it and everybody started improving leaps and bounds. I mean, it was, it was, the growth was exponential. I was actually not prepared for it. Um, and, and that, COVID hit right as I had started to put that framework into place and everybody had started to just like explode skill wise. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we kind of went down for a little while because everybody backed off. Everybody was kind of scared. Um, we, 
the we lost our space at the time, but we managed to keep the business going. I was working like 90 hour weeks trying to trying to keep things afloat and doing like two half hour sessions with everybody remotely a week. And it was it was a huge pain, but it was it was totally worth it at the end of the day because once COVID um once we kind of learned more about COVID and like print training outside was fine and so on and so forth, we, we all came back to it and almost mm-hmm. everybody came. Um, and then I started, but I'd had all this time now. I'd had three, four months. That was the pause I needed to realize, okay, this thing was working really well. How do I refine it once we finally do come back to it? And um, and I started experimenting with kind of a lot of different models in that. And uh, everybody started improving by leaps and bounds. There were some things that were better than others. You throw out the things that don't work. You keep the things that do and you build off of the things that do and extrapolate to replace the things that didn't, right? So um, all in all... Uh, that's about where Seneca came in. Um, the, and the, the, the big pointer for success for me was when people who struggled to learn through that prescriptive approach started improving at the same or better rate as people who were doing fine on the prescriptive approach. Right. And, um, and, and then our, our demographic and our audience and our membership kind of started self selecting in a way and, and people who could pick up that approach or could relearn that approach typically did better um, mm-hmm. and stayed. And, and then people who really just wanted to do the tech, they wanted to feel like they were sword fighting as opposed to they wanted to be fighting, right? Yeah. The, the people who just wanted to kind of play act at the thing or, or live out their, their idea of what the thing was mm-hmm. rather than the reality of it, th- those people generally didn't stick around very long. And, and we, ha- we kind of had to make a decision at that point that we were functionally a competition school. As opposed to a, um, you know, a, a sword club. So, um, but yeah, that, that's about where Seneca comes in, and I, I'd kind of be interested in hearing, you know, that perspective from him. Yeah. So, um, I uh, had a kind of contentious relationship with with Filipino martial arts. Um, you know, I did it for a really long time. I I still at some point need to go back so that I can formally say that I have instructor ranks because I'm like very shy of it. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I trained with Leslie Buck, um, who uh, is one of the people who um, rolled out the the defensive tactics and edge weapon countermeasures um, program for the Philippine Force Recon Marines, um, and then uh, later for, for their police force. And so this um, kind of tended towards some prescriptive stuff, although there's Contradictions. Um, I, there were a lot of constraints-based games in Pikiti, um, but they were always taught as an extension of the flow drills. <laughs> um, so you had to go through the flow drill to get to the, to the constraints-based game, usually. Yeah. Um, and so there were things that we brought, like um, we would do this thing called footwork sparring, um, which was basically, you know, starting off in a neutral position with like very sidestepping and then trying to juke around the other person to get to where you are facing, you know, their shoulders are behind. Um, and that had been like a consistent part of my warm up for eight years. Um, knife tapping, which is starts off as a flow drill, but then turns into a constraints based game where you, um, try to make contact with the other person's wrist and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this was mixed with this prescriptive approach. Um, and I, it kind of gelled for me a little bit because I, when I started jujitsu, I started getting really into like the straight blast gym stuff. Right. So I'm very familiar with like the, the, you know, the, the three eyes model. The Matt, Matt Thornton. Yep. Yeah. Although I now think that they teach too prescriptively. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Yep. Uh, because I, yeah, now every time I look at, at something Matt does now, he's like, this is why you have to do it exactly like Henry does it, or like Hickson does it. Um, mm. But, uh, and so those things have kind of come together, you know, because of COVID and because I like, you know, I live with a nearly 60 year old woman. Um, my girlfriend's um, mother lives with us. Um, I was not fucking around <laughs> when it came to like, you know, exposure. Uh, pre-vaccine and so i wanted to do a physical activity but i wanted to do it outdoors and the only things you could do outdoors were were this and um uh, were this or a collie and um basically nobody was masking up i didn't you know we didn't know about how safe outdoors was at the time mm-hmm. 
and uh, frankly, the the people who were still coming were all like the people that uh, bring off their knife collection whenever they come to class and like talk nice. about various scenarios where they want to use them in real life. And I'm like, yeah, fuck down, this is my hobby. Um, so uh, when I came to Bryant's class, uh, the first thing was I sandbagged super hard, and I was like, what's a sword? Um, and then. <laughs> You know, as we were going on, um, I noticed that he's basically doing the same thing every class. It was the same three games, um, you know, for, for the beginner's class. Um, and, you know, when he was making adjustments to some of these games, he you know, was basically um, asymmetrical um, evasion, asymmetrical guarding, and then asymmetrical suppression. Um, suppression being like, you know, pressing out stopping it from coming rather than than you know, catching here mm-hmm. um, i was like oh there's a name for what you're doing it's called a constraints based approach and i i had some familiarity with it one because of the straight blast stuff but two uh, because i helped coach um a, a kettlebell sport team before and so I, I knew more academic stuff about motor learning from the russian coaches who would come out and like all of those coaches when they would come out like all of them had masters or PhDs in something related to sports science. Mm. Uh, and that was like my first exposure to like really, really world-class um, training as an adult um, was when I was doing kettlebell sports. So I was like, oh yeah, this is the thing you're doing and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so here are the suggestions I would make to, to change it. Right. And so um, I think the first thing I did was like print it out um, your, your cheat sheet because I didn't want to have to write one myself. Um, and you know, we, we kind of did more of that stuff over the course of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, Bryant had to, to get back into doing a job full time for a little while. So I, um, basically took over, um, head coaching, which is really weird because I was the only person on the coaching staff who hadn't done HEMA. Um, but I, <laughs> but I knew how the, 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 co- how basically the training methodology worked. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, basically we have an onboarding class. Um, and, you know, the hardest things were, were making sure that we eliminated, um, block training. Um, and then the overemphasis on uh, internal postural cues, because in the beginner's training, we do a lot of action capacity improvement, right? Like, um, improving people's ability to hold a hinge and things like this. Yep. And so when you do all of this, like, physical training that's, you know, okay, here, take these steps and learn how to stay in the stance and stuff like that. Um, it's really easy to cue towards that stuff, right? Because we are trying to develop the capability to be able to get in these postures that are going to be useful later. Um, but we also don't want to just tell you to do the posture in the middle of the drill. Right. Uh, so, you know, we, we moved increasingly towards game-based warmups, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the diamond game, uh, is like one of our, our kind of prototypical ones we can teach somebody with no skill whatsoever, which is that we draw the diamond, right? That's that Filipino martial arts footwork. Uh, and then we have you stand at opposite points of the diamond and we say, okay, the only rules are you can't step inside of the diamond. Uh, and you have to touch either the shoulders or the knees. Right. Yeah. And um, at least one foot has to be on a point at all times. Right. So you have to like stay on this footwork paradigm. Um, but what you do within it is up to you. Um, and so that is usually how we start teaching uh, footwork now, um, is we just have people, you know, maneuver around and, you know, at, as there are level changes and stuff coming in, people start figuring out leg slips and things like this that'll then be applicable. Um, and then, you know, the, the basis of, of what he'd already put became, um, our core curriculum, which are, are asymmetrical or 10 count. Um, defensive drills where we basically uh, have somebody launch an attack from a, from any angle um, and then you perform an appropriate defense, right? We will specify uh, a category of defense, right? So I want you to try and make him miss you by as little as possible. Uh, I want you to make sure that you just stop it in some way by holding the weapon close to you uh, or you stop it by preventing his weapon from leaving him. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then figure it out. And then, you know, then we started to experiment with more constraints. So like with the suppression or the guard, okay, 
do this, but the other person's only going to feed with thrust. Okay. They're going to feed with thrust or without any other angle, but the constraint is your defense is only considered successful if you have the point on the target at the end of the defense, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, you're doing evasion, make the miss, but not just miss, but miss by as little as possible, right? Knowing that missing as little as possible, you're going to get hit in the process. That's fine. And then, you know, once they kind of learn that distance, then we would add in, all right, the constraint for this round is they're going to, you're going to make a miss you by as little as possible. And I want you to try and find a way to hit his limb. Um, when that does, right? Mm -hmm. We're teaching the, the distance at which single time counters are available. Um, you know, right now, um, one of the constraint drills we have is um, attack and maintain threat presence, right? So don't attempt to wound, but just keep the point on them as long as possible. They're going to try and displace your weapon, you know, defend against it, and you're just going to evade that and find a way to put the point back on them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that teaches a real specific distance, right? That's different from what would happen if the constraint was to try to wound. Um, and so that we've been working really hard on trying to develop these sets of games, uh, but also to, to figure out how to, to teach some of the stuff that, you know, frankly, better schools than us are, are teaching through prescriptive models in the game context, right? So like the, the core thing we're trying to do is, all right, Simbrogi, which is a, a school in Oklahoma, is going to show up at a competition and everybody at that school wrestled in high school. Like near 100% of those people wrestled in high school. And two of the best guys in the world are sparring with them, right? And that's part of the environment, right? Part of the constraints are yeah. that you are fighting Derek Nash. And we don't have Derek Nash. Uh, so we have to figure out ways, right? Like the thing you talked about earlier, like one of the things we have to, to make sure that our environment is making up for is the fact that, you know, from having split off, we don't have access to Anthony and Anthony's fucking badass, right? <laughs> um, but unfortunately the badassness doesn't always roll downhill. And so we have to make sure that like our smaller portion of badassness does roll downhill. Uh, yeah. and so that, that comes primarily through, through drill construction and then trying to find a tactical game, right? That either in the sources or in, uh, in just observation of competitions and figuring out how to zero in on that particular tactical game. Um, and we've done pretty well. So, um, the, the return to competition, um, last year, or I guess that was shit. That was still this year, wasn't it? It was weird. Um, which is an awesome competition. And, we took three out of four gold medals. Nice. Um, we, you know, we, next competition we went to, we had, I think, three people making it out rounds. And that was a competition that Simbrogi did show up to, right? So that was mm -hmm. the best guy in the United States was at that competition. Um, and then um, I forget, how did we do at the, at the dagger slash messer competition, Bryant? Yeah, at, at Knife Fight, we had, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. we had again an, another top fighter showed up and showed us out of some rounds who's who's just had years and years more to prepare in a much higher intensity environment but um we we achieved placement in every event i think that that our fighters were in um so we achieved top three or um every single fighter who went got into eliminations um so they made it past pools and got into eliminations and most of them did very well. They didn't necessarily do like get wiped in the first round of eliminations, for example. Um, I think, I think the lowest that one of our top guys did was like fourth place. So, I mean, he's, he, they're not getting knocked out early and, and we're a really young school by, by comparison to some of these other guys. So, yeah. What's yeah. really interesting is one of our top performers, uh, both at weird. Um, so like he, he didn't get touched a single time in prelims and then I uh, took second um yeah. the stagger um Isaiah only has one eye wow <laughs> uh, and, and he's got some other background as well but yeah we're definitely finding that people coming in reg almost like regardless of their background cuz we have a dude who has done nothing no physical activity no nothing um and he regularly gives uh experienced uh competitors trouble 
So um, we're, we're finding that, you know, my sort of shift into these models out of necessity, not, not knowing any of the science or anything behind it per se, but through experiential shift. Um, yep. And Seneca's, um, you know, more formal uh, education around these things and use thereof. Um, we're producing fighters that are coming in with little or no background relative to our sport. And, and we're making, you know, intermediate uh, level fighters or even fighters who can challenge other what we what is currently considered the standard of advanced in less than a year easily. Um, yeah, like and Colin, it six months, like yeah, I I think our our best example, like Colin, um, one of our fighters, you know, his first competition, Snagel Fecton, he basically was one point away from beating one of the finalists um, who was from Simbrogi, um, uh, and. You know, he has not been training that long. He's one of our coaches now. Um, the other example, so Sean started right after we stopped using prescriptive um, approaches entirely. And Sean is very frustrating because he is not the most athletic person in mm -hmm. our group by, by a long shot. Um, he's, my, he's my zero background reference that I used a moment ago. Yeah. Um, and he, like, yeah, he was like in the summers was like showing up in jeans and a bomber jacket and, and practicing <laughs> in Austin, Texas, uh, like what, uh, but the big thing about Sean, which is super interesting is that unlike people who had previous done sword fighting previously is he will not bite on feints. It's like it completely non-responsive. He is aware of the distance and will just tell you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> if you or do any provocation from outside. And so like, he frustrates much more experienced people because they're used to like using these opening gambits to provoke a reaction that they then capitalize on. And he has no reaction unless the threat is a hundred percent real. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, we attribute that to the fact that he was basically getting hit live from the very first session. And like, yeah, hey, his awareness of the, of the range is, is, the specifying information that he's using, whereas people who have a more mixed background and how they've been instructed, the sword they're is looking at, yeah. Right. Yeah. So they're not, maybe not as cognizant of the range and they're more worried about the, the movement itself of the faint. Yeah. And so we've started, um, and actually, Brian, we need to, <laughs> I, we need to renew because I switched off for my credit card. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we do the, the monthly meetings with, um, with Rob. Um, and so one thing that we've really started using a lot more is the errorless learning approach, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, where we're, we're making it more lopsided. Um, the one thing that is a little bit of a problem there is that like when you're doing asymmetric drills, if you remember from, from Rob's recent episode about errorless learning, yeah, is that, um, errorless plus interleaving is like super effective. Um, but error full, um, uh, and interleaving is super ineffective. And so when you're doing these asymmetric drills, the person doing the errorless learning, you're like, oh, you're getting the thing. Uh, but the person who's on the other side of the drill is doing the error full learning because you've stacked the deck against them. Um, so trying to figure out, you know, hmm. what the what the effects of that are, right, in terms of retention and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I think I think the funny thing about that is whenever I hear like errorful and errorless learning, those are usually, or errorless learning is usually like something that you do with like golfing, uh -huh. where you, you don't necessarily, you don't need another person on the other end that's getting the, the, the tough end of the stick. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, there is some, some, some thought to put into that. Yeah. I, I am interested. So you talked about your onboarding class. Um, I, I'm assuming that you have like an intermediate, like an advanced class or a class that you come out of the onboarding class into. How do you approach practice design for each session? Do you have like kind of a, a set curriculum that you just kind of modify or do, are you doing something different or custom or individualized every session that you're going into? Um, so the coaches, so for the, the, for the novice class, I guess we'll get to Brian in a second because he's doing all of those. Um, for the intermediate class, um, what we do is we get the coaches together and we talk through our observations and what we think people suck at, basically, mm -hmm. uh, ourselves. Um, 
fil filtered through the lens as well of like what competition is coming up. Yeah. Uh, and what the rule sets for those competitions are and the, and the types of fighters we expect to be there. Yeah. So um, we pick probably two or three things that we'd like to see improved um, or like maybe a, a, a tactic um, that we would like people to be able to employ some more. And then we go, okay, what games could express that tactic? So like right now, um, there's a thing that we observe the Simbrogi guys doing, um, mm -hmm. which uses a tortured analogy. Brian, can you explain the speaking window in like under a minute? <laughs> Um, now, I, I don't know that I can do justice to their interpretation of this idea, but functionally, um, uh, I, I'll use my own words for this. Imagine that you have a pointed uh, long stick right in your hands, and I'm going to point it at you. So generally, when I point it at you, I'm going to have um, a selection of targets that could range from, though foot is illegal, right, um, calf to head. Um, speaking window is functionally going to say that if there is an opportunity, especially when uh, there's a potential for a bind, I'm going to uh, kind of supersede that bind. I'm, I'm going to roll over it and I'm going to point high. And I'm essentially removing my hands from the equation of the target. In addition, I am aiming for the mouth, um, somewhere in the vicinity of the mouth. Um, it's going to give me the head to the chest as a target area for, for potential wounding and a scoring a point. And um, I'm going to shoot the point in from this forward press position that I'm kind of already in, right? Um, so I'm, I'm taking the end of a previous action and then shooting straight in mm. towards a relatively high target. Um, and that does a number of things, both defensively and offensively. Um, it's a clearly a highly pressuring action. Um, as long as you do it at the right time, you're generally relatively safe when you do this. So um, speaking window is just kind of like you go to knock on the door and when they open the window, when your opening presents itself, you shoot through the speaking window, right? And, the, and that old like chamber door kind of like, who's there? Kind of. Yeah. Project. Yeah. So the idea is using a forward threat um, to one, simplify your tactical responses, right? So like whatever they do, you're using kind of a long, uh, a long extended position as a response to the thing. Um, and then using the threat to cause them to, to withdraw, right? Um, so the Simbroki guys have been working really hard on this. And Jeremy Pace, who's their coach, teaches this through like a two hour long lecture. Um, and I'm like, well, I don't have time for the two hour long lecture. Our classes are only an hour and a half. Long. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, the last block we started on the first hot, first part of this, which was, um, how do we teach Abzetsin, which is like putting aside, um, an incoming thrust with your own. Um, and so those we started working on. Okay, your defense only counts if your point is on the target at the end of it, right? So if you defend their strike, but your point is off, you lost the exchange, right? Um, or um, you're going to attack, you're going to defend, I want you to contest for whose point is on who. Uh, in, in variations of this, right? So that was during the last block. And so in this one, we've, we've switched towards uh, more proactive, right? So um, how long and how many intentions or changes can you continue to keep the point on the person? Um, and what we found and we didn't anticipate is this uniquely exhausting, uh, for the mm -hmm. opponent, um, because the motions you're making are very small. They're the equivalent of like the four to, the four to six disengage in, um, Olympic fencing. Uh, and they are in response to that, having to take a step and shift their torso entirely from left to right. Right. And they're having to do this, you know, several times over the course of like five to 10 seconds. And so it starts to get really, really tiring. Um, and so this is, you know, we're training this a couple of ways, um, you know, basically, so we'll decide on the outcome, right? The, the, the constraint or what we want the constraints to model towards the behavior for. Um, and then basically on Monday, um, Stephen and one of our other coaches will come up with some games that he thinks we'll get there. And on Wednesday, I'll try and come up with variations, right? Something that looks different from whatever games um, Steven did on Monday um, around the same behavior. And then we observe and see like what behaviors did the game produce? So for example, Sean, the guy who doesn't um, bite on feints, when we said, put the threat on and switch sides, right? Do, do it by whenever there's 
whenever there's a response, we want you to get away from the weapon switch sides. Instead of doing the four to six disengage, which is what most people um, intuitively do, is doing this VEC motion. It's like this kind of like helicopter swing, um, twisting motion mm. like this, um, and to switch sides. And so in the process of pointing the point on the target, when he switches sides, he's taking a hand shot and going in. And we didn't teach him that, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's really interesting. We're like, huh, okay, let's take a look at that. Because in some other exchanges, when he's doing this, Sean is suicidally putting himself onto the point. But this, this seems unique. Is there a way we can reproduce this um, or that particular solution? Um, and so, you know, we typically will progress over the course of the session from the most generic drills, right? So the warm up is usually something like light sparring or um, one of the 10 count defense drills or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we add constraints to, <clears throat> um, to model towards a specific um, behavior and then typically would end either with free sparring or with a game that is meant to bias towards the tactics that, that you may have been working on, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the games when we were trying to work on specifically bind presence was called Sticky Icky, um, which is very silly. Uh, but basically the rules were um, one person is the sticker, one is the icker. Um, the one who is sticking can only score while he is maintaining bind presence on his opponent. And the other person can only score if there is no bind presence. Neat. Right? So That's cool. Three of the blade. And, and there is like a, so over the course of several sessions, right? Like people start to develop solutions to these environments. Um, what we're ultimately, what, what our job is as coaches, right? Is to present environments where, uh, that they think are going to frustrate them when they go to the next competition, for example, or that, that we know already frustrate them based on their current skill sets, uh, them being the members. So, um, when they come up with their solutions, it, usually within the first couple of practices that they attend um, in a given, we would say, quote unquote, block, uh, they they then spend the rest of that block refining those solutions to some degree. And, mm -hmm. and so by the end of the block alone, they, they tend to be very, very competent at, at whatever solution they've come up with. And is it's not our job to produce a specific solution. It's our job to in, to to um, force the member, force the training person into a situation where their solution is viable under pressure, um, and and the pressure of the drills is another variable that like we increase over time. And if at some point we increase it and their solution starts to fail, fail they tend to find another solution, right? Um, but now they've got the gist of the problem, and they find more solutions faster. And some people will actually. Um, we had we had one individual who rarely used the same solution across sessions consistently. Almost every it was almost like they were just exploring. Like they, um, I I'm very 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 uh, guilty of this. Though I do compete, um, I'm not a particularly competitive person by my nature. I'm more interested in the exploration of movement and the art and mm -hmm. um, like the does it actually work or does it not work? And yeah. so. From a given session to a given session, my tactics will change entirely, and I, or sometimes I will go out of my way to replicate the the tactical preferences like a, of another school. Um, and so I've I've gotten a reputation as kind of like the mimic of the group, um, and also as a teacher that is a tremendously valuable skill because I how many different kinds of you know problem environments can I create alone? Um, being able to do that sort of thing. So um, it's something that I've never really let go of because it's useful to the rest of my group. But, um, you know, this individual would, would eschew performance over discovery. Um, and they would still toss out options if they didn't work. And so they ended up having this almost like catalog in their head of solutions that uh, other people would never have ever thought of because they went through the obvious lunch and just threw them out. Um, not because, or if I should say not threw them out, filed them away. 
because they were almost too obvious, right? What are other solutions within these constraints? And they would get really creative within the box. Um, and that definitely, while they were here, had a, had a big influence on um, you know everyone else because they would they would see these creative solutions and they would think to themselves, "My solution is good. My solution is working." But my solution is really plain and really easily anticipated in many cases. And so they would look at these other creative solutions and say, this is just as efficient, but is way less predictable. Um, and, and every time that we get a fighter in with, or an athlete in with a different background, especially martial arts, but different background in general, even, even football players, like yeah. move differently, right? Compared to like a, an Olympic fencer. So, um, they tend to find different solutions and that, that influences the rest of our membership into um you know being more creative or more efficient or uh, dealing with different pressures and higher variability absolutely yeah so it's definitely a lot of like everyone in the school has in their head what are they going to do when colin draws you on a forehand strike steps to the outside steps in and presses your hand down right um you know colin's able to pretty reliably land this on everybody at every level of competition, right? Um, and no two people in the school try to stop him from doing that in the same way. Um, similarly, you know, we, we have you know, people who who only do the same thing. Sometimes they're frustrating levels. So one of our our more consistent competitors, Bo, has what like fifteen years of of uh, FA experience prior to doing this. It's at least a decade, yeah. Um. And he does very well in competition because he's very disciplined. He only sticks to his A game. But it's sometimes very difficult because we've been trying to get him to develop a B game. Uh, and so you know, some of that has been like setting aside entire sessions to coach one of our other fighters. Usually it's Colin on how to frustrate his A game as hard as possible so that we just like make him do something else, anything else. I don't give a shit what, but whatever the main thing he's doing, make it not work. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'm I'm curious um what what was your injuries? What did they look like before you started using like a constraints based approach versus after? Has it changed? Has it gotten better? Has it stayed the same? What how did that change? Uh yeah, I'll I'll take that one cuz I uh, I have one I have the background and two I have the injuries. Um so, uh, I found even minor injuries. So we're going to include even minor injuries and in, in kind of what I bring up. So like, um, split thumbs, right. Or like, or fingernails or like f fingernails fall off or stuff like that. Like little things all the way up to like, we're tearing muscles, right. Um, or we're breaking, we're breaking bones, um, concussions. Uh, I have. There is a dramatic difference between the prescriptive approach and the constraints led approach, uh, injury wise, mm -hmm. as a top level statement. Like it, it's just an astronomical difference. Um, we, and of course, knock on wood, but um, we have not had a significant injury. That was, it was, I'm going to say, that was not self induced. Um, I think the most significant injury that we've had at practice in the last, uh, since I started the school, honestly, um, has been somebody pulled their hamstring hmm. because they lunged too far yeah. on hurt where they slipped also. So it's like, think about your environment, what is appropriate in your environment to some degree, but also, you know, and, and then we address that as coaches later with that individual. But that's the worst thing that's happened. Um, we've had some good knocks to thumbs, um, or, or fingers. Uh, I think one, we might've had one broken finger, two, maybe uh, yeah. over the course in, in, in structured practices in coast yeah. practices in the last three years. And about um, waffle, that's about it. <laughs> yeah. So we have this to go waffling, which is like when you get hit in the mask and the, there's a, the mask is a dome. Um, and unless the hit comes in in a certain way, the dome will kind of pop back out. And uh, if the dome gets bent in, so sometimes the, the thrust comes in so hard with a with a inflexible weapon that the dome will kind of bend in, and the mesh of the dome will leave a hatch mark, 
wherever it hits, uh, <laughs> it will pop back out. And you yeah. like, there's a little bit of a disorienting moment. And, and, you know, there's a, some people would say you've been hit too hard if that happens. What we have found is that mm-hmm. most of the time it happens, like in competition, you've been hit too hard. Yeah. But many, many times, especially in training, it will happen um, when that force collides at like a very specific angle. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just the structural integrity of the thing as it relates to the shape, right? So um, that's, but that's just, that's the equivalent of getting a scratch on your arm, um, right. you know, through the, through the mask. So um, we prepared we two women for, for Dog Brothers. Do you know what Dog Brothers is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the two women that, that compete regularly in Dog Brothers come to us to do sparring preparation because none of the FMA groups locally spar hard enough for them. <laughs> so, so they travel in San Antonio usually for their yeah. for their training. That's cool. Uh, and so, but they, they train with us when they're getting ready for, for Dog Brothers. And no one got injured during the prep cycle for Dog Brothers, where you know we are, you know, we don't hit terribly hard when we're training for HEMA competition because you only need enough contact for the judge to call it right. Right. Uh, whereas when we're training them, we need to to train with some level of authority, right? Because no one's no judge is going to stop it. You have to hit them hard enough that they want want to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, not a single injury during when when we've trained them for events. Yeah. So I mean, we we regularly spar at kind of dog brothers level intensity, especially as we're approaching tournaments before we kind of back off for recovery um, pre event, and that's been true for a long time. Um, I I one of the reasons that I kind of started my own group was that I was really unimpressed with the injury rate um, within like traditional HEMA, and. Uh, we were having everything from um, really common, like broken thumbs. Over the course of, I think, two or two or three years, when I was teaching EMA, I think I saw like five or six broken thumbs. Um, I saw sprained muscles all the time. I saw like impingement issues show up regularly. Um, we had somebody who who you know pulled muscles in their calf. Um, it was it was frequent that somebody was out with something. And if you're out, you can't train. And if you can't train, you don't improve. So um, it was a it was a resolution on my part to reduce the injury rate. Um, and when I shifted that semi prescriptive model, uh, it, it went down, but we were still having issues because people were trying to yeah. replicate the examples. Right. Um, when we shifted to the constraint sled, and I just said, find a solution that works. Here's this problem situation. Find a solution that works. People found solutions uh, that were largely adapted to their own body types, mm-hmm. uh, their own their own you know physical properties. And w- the only corrections that I need to make, or Seneca needs to make, or one of our coaches need to make from a from a mechanical standpoint is: is your body actually designed to move in the way you're trying to present the solution? Let's just like adjust the positioning slightly, like. You don't want to overhinge because then you can't recover. Your balance is too forward. You might get hit in the back of the head or something like that. You're presenting targets. It's a safety issue. Or you you want to try this inverted thrust, but your shoulder is binding up, right? And it's because you're not rotating around your thoracic spine enough to open up this angle effectively. Um, so, you know, we make like minor mechanical adjustments, but for the most part, people are finding solutions that just fit their bodies better um, that are still tactically and competitively viable. The, the other thing I think as far as, as, and I think this is especially noticed to be true in striking arts. Um, if you're in an art respar every session, right, or, or pretty regularly, um, but all the training is done compliantly or, or prescriptively, um, you do not have an index for what 0% effort, 5%, and so on, right? Mm-hmm. You've only experienced compliant and yeah. wrecking you right yeah. um, and so making adjustments to intensity on the fly as appropriate to your level of fatigue and stuff like this is so it's not just that you're doing different physical things right but like the volume and intensity at which you perform a physical activity is a strong indicator of the likelihood of injury um, and somebody who is doing purely prescriptive training cannot auto regulate that they don't know how hard they're going. Um, 
whereas, you know, because the drill structure right now is graded exposure to non-compliance, everybody realizes, okay, the drill just got a little bit harder, right? And mm-hmm. the, the different feels are. Um, and so they're able to scale down their intensity or go, hey, I'm a little bit tired. I need to stop. They don't, they don't know when their performance is about to nosedive if they haven't had that graded exposure. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and find, you know, and I've noticed definitely the same thing when I was boxing and stuff like this, right? Uh, because if the only thing you've done is hitting the mitts, well, you hit the mitts as hard as you can, right? Um, and then you're like, okay, well, now do the same thing, but do it to that guy's skull. Um, and there's been nothing in between. Uh, and it's even worse because all that time on the bag and the mitts has been improving your your action capacities, right? So all we've been doing every session is learning how to hit harder. Uh, and now, like, I'm going to hit a target that I don't know how to adjust appropriately to. Um, so, you know, th- those are definitely things we've noticed in terms of, of training. Because we go to other schools or other places sometimes where they don't do as much sparring as us and like they're fucking each other up, right? Like hitting each other with really bad intentions. Yeah. 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 This stuff, I, what, what floored me when I first got into the ecological dynamic space and the constraints led approach was when probably a few, quite a few years ago now, probably four years, Rob Gray was going over, Dr. Gray was going over some research in like practice design and like safety and injuries and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he, he's like, yeah, more, more, more unstable variable practice is actually safer. And it makes you more injury proof in the future, which that is against everything I had ever been taught <laughs> in martial arts. Yeah. Uh, I had never, ever, ever heard that before. And now that I understand how things work on more of a mechanical level, it does make sense. But that was a, it was a totally, for, before I heard that, it was a limiting belief to me that I couldn't get into live training for beginners immediately to get them to starting immediately. Um, the caveat being that you want to use task simplification and you want to make sure that they're not literally trying to kill themselves day one. But um, with most people, that's not a problem. You know, you get a young kid that's played sports his whole life, that might be a problem. But um, but most people, it's like, it's not a problem. They're not trying to kill each other and they don't want to be killed. But yeah, that that's something that um, it was a significant, it's, a, it's one piece in the, in the, in the broad ecological space, but it was a significant piece for me. It was like, well, if it's going to help with build better skill, but it's also going to make them safer, that's like a win-win situation. Why would I do it the other way? Right. Yeah, it, we, we've definitely... Um, the fact that we can train people up to higher skill levels faster with fewer injuries overall, like it, across the board, these, these things are just facts for us mm-hmm. um, with this approach, right? Um, speaks to may, maybe a necessity for the education of this across, <laughs> across applied martial arts in general. Um, yeah. And, and I will, I'll add, I'll add something. Um, there is a, between the uh, force education Right. Uh, functionally, it's education around the amount of force that's being output or the amount of effort that's being put in. Um, and the pressured environment that, that we consistently train within, because we basically don't do compliant drills. We don't ever. Um, I will display the thing and I'll ask for people to use less force initially and then shift up to like light sparring levels of force and then go to this thing. But at no p- just allow somebody to hit them. That's just not part of our game. That's not how right. we do it because that's not realistic. Yep. Um, we have found, I have found in, in the course that I've been doing this and uh, as, as somebody running the beginner practices, people that, especially people who come in for sword stuff, but people who come in for martial arts, um, there are two big red flag kind of personas. One of which is somebody who 
has developed a fantasy of what the thing is and they're trying to live up to the fantasy of it yep. rather than open their mind to the reality of it and, and work within that framework. Or, um, and, and I call that like protagonist syndrome, right? They're, they're <laughs> the main character and they're, uh, I think it's an actual syndrome, but um, they're, they're the main character in their martial arts journey, which yeah. excuse their partners. They're, they're, they may escalate force trying to fulfill their fantasy, right? Right. Um, this goes hand in hand with a kind of person who is like, um, well, that's not what a real fight is like. You know, the, the come in, I, you know, not, not quite the, I only see red bro guys, but, um, <laughs> but those guys sometimes come in too. Swords doesn't attract those people as much because they tend to think it's too nerdy. But, um, yeah. you know, and maybe there's a third type, which is the, well, actually kind of guys. Yeah. Um, the anime guy. Yeah. Well, and, and that fits under the fantasy dudes as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you know we do get some anime guys, but uh, what I have found is that we, in our method, uh, you know, in our local area, is uniquely suited to taking people who um, attempt to create fantasies for themselves, or who uh, just try to go too hard, right? For whatever reason, a real fight, I'd go all out or, um, you know, in my fantasy, I'm like super strong or whatever. Any, or, or anyone even who's just trying to go too fast, like faster than their body can support or mm -hmm. uh, faster than a safe in the drill. Um, that gradient of force, they, they burn themselves out in the first 30 minutes of class of practice. And then they spend the next hour getting stabbed in the face over and over and over and over. And it really disabuses them very, very quickly of whatever notion they have about, you know, what we do and their place in it. Um, if they just wanted to show up and swing a sword because they felt like it looked cool or because they wanted to hit somebody with a sword, um, they're going to find within, within minutes that that's not going to work out for very well for them in the long term. And those people tend to self-select out. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, once you, once you break their fantasy, they leave. And, um, my fighter's safety and improvement and growth is more important than those other people's money. So I'm not going to try and keep them right. Um, we, but the ones who do stay, who say, wait, I had this fantasy. I tried to go to our, it didn't work. So clearly something is wrong with my idea of this thing. Right. And then they get curious and they stay. Or we have people with a track record of issues, maybe. Um, and they come to us when nowhere else will take them because they love doing the thing. Maybe their force output is too high, right? Um, they come to us largely as a <laughs> everywhere, everywhere else is just like hired them, maybe, um, in some cases or, or has issue or like they think they're a safety concern, right? For us, we're used to a higher intensity of training. They're not immediately a safety issue until they prove that they're a safety issue. Um, we know as coaches that going in, we're paying special attention to them. If mm -hmm. you hit a sword too hard from the beginning, we're going to be honest with them. Like you need to dial that shit down or you need to fuck off. Um, but that force education that is built into all of our training um, and the way that we don't, we don't we try not to give just verbal cues in the middle of training. Um, yeah. That just, that doesn't do a lot of good, right? Instead, we create environments where those people have to solve the force problem as part of the solution, like as part of yeah. part of completing the drill. That's the win condition, not hitting the other person. Hitting the other person ends the rep, but it doesn't win the drill. Um, people will say, don't try to win the drill. No, I want you to win the drill. I want you to win the drill because, but I'm going to tell you what the win condition is. And, it, and it's going to be, I want you to tap that dude in the head. I want you, that guy to know it could have been a hell of a lot worse, right? So um, we take people who honestly have had issues in the past um, or people who have these fantasies around what, what we do is, and, and we effectively break those things, um, those habits or that muscle memory or those fantasies. And then people who maybe were less suitable for what we do before actually become suitable for what we do. Um, and it's just part of the methodology. So we, though we've had to kind of select people who are interested in like a competitive level of training and we lose a lot of people who want to do it casually, um, mm -hmm. to some degree, we also have broadened our audience to people who would do it competitively, 
but who might be problem students in other places. Um, and, and we effectively just train them out of the problem behaviors within the constraints of like how we operate. Excellent. Awesome. So, um, what are you, you met, you showed me a book earlier I, that I also have. Um, yeah. what, what were the biggest influences on how you guys have approached training from when you first started game space approaches down to today? What are your, what are your biggest influences? Seneca, you want to start with that one? Yeah. So I would say the, the earliest, the game space approaches, um, before I came on, I think the biggest influence is probably Simbrogi, um, who are like not academic, right? But they're just, they're the best competitive school in the United States, right? Yeah. Um, they have a very they, like, um, hit and don't get hit mentality. Cause at the end of the day, every martial arts and every winning all the rules, all the variations of rules in every competition come down to if you never get hit, they never get points. If you hit them, you get points. So if you don't get hit and you hit the other dude, right? Um, so all of their training, even though it is, it, it can be prescriptive or semi-prescriptive comes down to that point. So that was a, that was a huge influence on us early on. Um, and then, you know, Rob's mm -hmm. book, um, the straight blast gym, um, uh, early materials, not, not the current stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, then, um, train ugly, um, yeah. has been a big influence because it, it is a version of the model that can be taught to a non-academic person. Uh, because like I, you know, one of our coaches, Steven just had a kid. I'm not expecting him to read three books, right. Um, uh, on how to coach, um, while he's coaching uh, and raising his child. Uh, and so being able to boil down the basic things like make it as game-like as possible or make it as much like the game that we're trying to play as possible, uh, make it as many reps of that as possible, right, with as many different looks as possible, um, interleave, you know, just as like the, you know, enough, uh, a small enough number of things that you can put it onto a note card um, has been really important for us. Uh, I think that, um, yeah, the, the train ugly stuff has been a really big influence. Um, continuing to talk to Rob, uh, has been in terms of experimentation. One of the things that we want to play with is some of the visual blurring stuff. Next time we meet with them, I'm going to mm -hmm. try and dig a little bit into, uh, we're going to do some goofy shit, and, you know, put people in goggles and see what happens. Nice. Uh, because that's the other thing, Sh because two, so two of our people with the best reading, Sean has a visual impairment and Isaiah has one eye. Uh, and after, you know, listening a little bit to Rob, we're like, Oh, this maybe makes sense because they're, they're having to pay attention to secondary visual cues instead of just like fixating quiet eye on a single spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think those have been really big influences and also just ass whoopings. Um, mm -hmm. Like whenever us <laughs> get just roundly like Jeremy Pace, who's the, who's the, the coach at Simbrogi is the only person in, in swordsmanship who has made me feel the way I feel when I'm on the bottom of like a, a, a good competitive jujitsu black belt. Right. Yeah. Um, most, most other people, even like Derek Nash, who's like, top 10 in the world um, feels like just a dude, a normal dude who's making better decisions than you're making. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I don't feel like he's stronger or faster than me. Right. Um, he's just ha has a better, better sense of what he's supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy mm -hmm. makes me feel like I don't know how to fuck, how to fight at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think, for um, for Brian, uh, I always forget how to say a guy's name. Uh, the the Spaniard. Yeah, uh, Tom Puy. Yeah, he's a he's a um, he's from he's from Spain. He is a uh, rapierist, and and he studies something like a Spanish style of swordsmanship called the Stretza. Um and uh, it's a shortened name for it. But he, I can I know what he's doing. We sparred once ever. And, um, I, even against, I, I haven't really sparred Jeremy Pace, but even, even in the kind of play stuff that I've done with Jeremy Pace, I, 
I would venture to say that I, I did not feel as helpless against Jeremy um, as I did against Tom Pui. I've also never done longsword with Jeremy, so I'm sure I'm sure I would feel mm. the same way. With longsword. Um, he's been doing that longer, but I I was just on every level outmatched. Um, I could tell what was happening. I could sometimes present a threat, but it was never a. It was almost like uh, ethereal to him. Like he could just move through threats. He always knew where to go. He always knew how to get out. He always knew how to take mechanical advantage of the situation. Um, yeah, and 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 I felt played with. And Seneca has kind of described playing with Jeremy Pace as, you know, um, a cat with a ball of yarn, and you're the ball of yarn. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and that's very much how I felt with Ton. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, one of the th things that I, for me at least, has been a huge influencer, um, and, and Seneca largely spoke to a lot of it, um, is because I came to this from an experience-based position, not, not from an education-based perspective, um, keeping an open mind with the priority of student growth first. And just being willing to question what you're doing. Don't say, I need them to do this thing. I need them to succeed. And these, this is the environment I want them to succeed in. If I want them to be able to spar well without constraints, because that's the fun part, right? Like stop putting rules in and get to just fuck around. Yeah. Um, if I want them to be able to spar well without constraints, then I have to admit that sparring is an entirely different animal than drilling. Um, and I need to drill or play like I want to play. So um, again, you know, bringing bringing your training closer to what you're actually going to be doing. But um, that means that if I have a technique and I'm not seeing that technique manifest, stop. Don't narrow your sights. Don't put blinders on. Don't get obsessed with the technique. Say. Why is this not showing up? Maybe it's actually not viable, or maybe I'm not teaching it in a reasonable way. Um, break down the barriers between you and your students' growth. Those barriers are generally in internal to yourself as a coach, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're generally limitations in your perspective. So really decide what matters most to you. Is it teaching? Is it the technique? Is it the cultural preservation? If it is the cultural preservation, you're not going to see these things in sparring. Just be honest about it. You're, you're not going to see them as much. Unless you might see them sometimes. Huh? And then you'll, you'll, unless you're Demon, and then you'll do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, right, yeah. And then there are fighters, of course, who, who are just so experienced that they're going to be able to reproduce anything in any situation just from experience, right? Um, they know all the timing. They know all the rhythm. They know all the distance. But um, in the average student, you just may not see these techniques when they're sparring. And that's okay. Remember that what you're doing is you're preserving the culture. Um, you're not necessarily trying to create a fighting art. Um, if you are, fighting is dynamic and fighting is highly variable. And fighting is a high stress situation. And what comes out is going to be influenced by adrenaline and um, the other, the, the, there's all the set of variables that entails yeah. one person and then all the set of variables that entails another. Too many, right? Combined. Yeah. Like by each other, it's infinite. So, just be honest with yourself about what you're doing and what your goals are. Um, the, the knowing that a huge influence on me as a, as a teacher, as a coach is watching their growth, watching my students growth, watching the members growth. They, as they improve, that tells me I'm doing something right as they improve against the, the priorities that I have, right. And that the school has. So um, don't discount the, the influence of your your members' performance as you know some something that is is going to lead you to, in the right direction for what your goals are. Excellent. Uh, another big influence for me has been um, the Barbell Medicine folks. Uh, or do you listen to their podcast any by any chance? I, I do listen to Barbell Medicine and um, I follow the everyone around kind of starting strength. It's the, I, I've, the last five weeks I've actually spent uh, investing in barbell training because I've 
And it's been resolving, I mean, this is tangential, but it's actually been resolving longstanding entries. So I'm really pumped about that. But yeah, what, what, um, go ahead on that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a big influence. There are two portions there. Um, first has been, um, although we don't, I haven't spelled it out for the coaches, partially because of the way we move towards constraints based model is that, um, the, the biopsychosocial approach to pain is kind of embedded in how we coach too. Right. Yeah. So we don't tell you if you move like that, your shoulder's going to explode. Uh, <laughs> we tell you that like you, you can do anything if you train for it and you should know whether or not you're trained for the thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. you know, it's not that if you move like that, your shoulder's going to explode, but like if you move like that, really fast and explosive and you haven't moved like that before, then maybe you should move at a graded intensity. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's opened up a lot of degrees of freedom and like, basically we're not using psychology to put our students in, in pain <laughs> anymore, which is yeah. cool, right. They're, they kind of tell their students that they're fragile. Um, Absolutely. The other thing is um, even though we're a competition school, Right. Like getting the medal is not the whole purpose of the school. Right. For most people, the big, biggest threat to their life is being sedentary and not having a community. Right. And so, um, for a lot of our students, right, who may have just been anime nerds or whatever before, um, as the training gets more competitive, it becomes the reason that they start lifting weights, you know, the reason they start going jogging and so on, right? Um, and producing those changes, right, is is more important, right? Because that, like, literally, you know, some may live five, ten years longer because they found a community that encouraged them to regard themselves as an athlete, right, in a healthy mm -hmm. way. Uh, yeah. And that, like, you know, as much as, you know, may rag on participation profies, keep in mind that, like, for the vast majority of the population, participation in these activities is vastly more important than whether or not you get the medal. We're, we're going to get you to the medal, too, but, like, you should have a physical hobby that's appropriately dosed to you. And that's, like, super mm -hmm. important to have that community. Um, like, something that I'm very proud of that we didn't mention before one of our students who's able to competitively spar and give other people problems is a 68 year old man with a pacemaker. Wow. Yeah. Right. And like he stabs people in the throat when they are not letting him do it. That's awesome. <laughs> that's a big Testament. That's a big Testament to the methodology. Um, that's awesome. Well, you guys, this has been, this has been really, really awesome. I think we've covered a lot here. If we keep, I mean, we could keep going. I could keep going. Um, <laughs> but I've got to get work done today too. But uh, I think the, the listeners might, <laughs> it'd be hard for them to follow if we get go any longer. But, um, where can the listeners find you guys? If they want to reach out or, or consume yeah, any of medias or yours? <laughs> yeah. Um, if people want to find us, honestly, uh, hop onto Google. And just search Arena Weapon Arts. I could give you the URL. I could give you the Facebook. I could give you whatever. Google Arena Weapon Arts, and all those things will show up in a list. Um, so uh, check us out. Go check the Facebook page. There's a bunch of sparring videos on there. Um, you can also ask questions through there if you want to uh, hit up the website through the search. Um, I think the the URL might show up as something a little different, but searching Arena Weapon Arts will get us. And then um, you know. Shoot me, shoot me a message. If you're in Austin, come train with us. I'll let you drop in. Happy to spar with you. I'll stab you in the face. So <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, guys, thank you again for coming on. Um, and I hope that we can actually, uh, I think we have more to talk about. We, can, we need to do this again. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks so much for listening to the Combat Learning Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. It really helps us out. Finally, this episode, including the intro music, is produced by Micah Peacock. Thanks in advance, and I'll see you on the next episode.